welcome everybody to our webinar today about sports contracts and the force majeure provision in them specifically and how that's affected by the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're really glad you could join us today and uh, Professor Wilson Hewn and I uh, will be leading a moderated discussion. So our goal today is to communicate a couple of very brief doctrinal points, but then really to hear from you and your thoughts about uh, how sports are affected, especially in light of the contracts between the sports leagues and the players. So I'm gonna get started with a really brief uh, uh, introduction uh, via PowerPoint, just to share a couple of key doctrinal concepts, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to that. And, uh, and then we'll get into our discussion. So as I mentioned, we're, we're gonna to focus today on how COVID-19 may be triggering what are called force majeure provisions in contracts for national sports leagues. So a preliminary question should be, what is force majeure? And force majeure is uh, somewhat inaptly named uh, an act of God because it can include things that are uh, caused by man, such as war, but uh, basically they are clauses in a contract that explains what is the party's understanding about who bears the risk of loss in the event of some type of uh, catastrophe, uh, some major uh, force, some major event. And here's a, a simple example of one. Um, and what you'll see is this is going to have language where the parties have allocated uh, between each other who bears certain risks. So to read briefly, uh, an example of a clause might be, this contract is subject to force majeure and is contingent on strikes, accidents, acts of God, weather conditions, inability to, sec to secure labor, fire regulations, or restrictions imposed by any government or governmental agency, or other delays beyond the control of the parties. If performance within the contract time is prevented by any cause of force majeure, then this contract shall be void without penalty to either party for any such portion not delivered. In other words, the parties have agreed that if one of these triggering events happens, the contract will be effectively canceled. And the parties can agree uh, to a great many things and they can specify or not the type of triggering events. So there are a couple of purposes for this. One purpose in having these clauses is it provides some clarity uh, because otherwise we're going to be looking at parties seeking the excuse of frustration of purpose or impracticability, which means you have to go to court and litigate things that maybe it's better to specify in advance uh, and to talk about who should bear the risk in terms of an agreement. And this might um, uh, help uh, avoid some of the default rules that parties may not want to get captured by, by expressing between themselves what is their actual agreement. So that's the hope at least, that's the goal of these, but let's take a look at a couple of the specific agreements now and, um, and we're gonna put those up on the screen but uh, what we're going to do now is, is see how the NBA, the Major League Baseball, and the National Football League have attempted to allocate these risks uh, among, among each other. Uh, Professor Hewn, before I, I dive in, and while I'm getting the contracts up on the screen, anything else you'd like to add about the doctrinal context we're working in? Yeah, we're, what we're talking about here is the difference between a breach of a contract and avoidance of a contract if the doctrine of excuse applies or if the force majeure clause applies, which is uh, really having the same effect, the party's performance is excused. You know, the fact that they didn't perform is not a breach. It is excused and uh, we're gonna rescind the contract. And that means that the both parties' performance will be discharged. Neither one of them owes anything except maybe restitution of some benefits that they've already conferred that haven't been paid for. If the doctrine of excuse doesn't apply, or if a force majeure clause does not apply, and the party doesn't perform, well, that's a breach. You know, they have breached the contract, and instead of a rescission, the other party is going to cancel and sue for breach. So it's this. This really is critically important uh, in terms of whether you've got a breach of a contract, and somebody's going to be liable for breach, or whether you've got a rescission of a contract a discharge of performance and avoidance of the contract and you know putting everybody back into the position they were in um, without anybody being sued for breach. 
So let's take a look at the terms then and see if they, uh, if they operate effectively. Um, and so on your screen here, and, and I did send this around in advance, so uh, hopefully you had a chance to look at, if not, um, the NBA has a rather lengthy uh, provision or set of provisions regarding the force majeure uh, concept. So I'll give you a moment to, to read that, but while you're, um, while you're kind of familiarizing yourself with the terms, if you haven't already, uh, Professor Hume, you, you had a couple remarks. I think you noticed that this was a particularly detailed uh, provision. And in fact, it spans uh, a page and a half. And we're gonna compare that to much shorter provisions elsewhere. What are some key things our um, attendees might wanna notice about this as they're reading through it? He's muted. Sorry about that. Uh, that happens at least once a class, Seth. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you're studying for contracts or for sales, you'll notice that this force majeure clause pretty much tracks the doctrine of excuse. I mean, just about everything that could be covered by the doctrine of excuse is here in this force majeure clause, meaning that they're taking full advantage of uh, the doctrine of excuse, full advantage of the fact that, hey, there might be something that prevents us from performing, but we don't want it to constitute a breach. In other words, these are risks that they are not assuming. And they, they say that um, if there's an event or contingency or condition that makes it impossible to perform or that frustrates the purpose of the contract or that makes it economically impracticable to perform, all three of those doctrines are written right into the, you know, paragraph A. So yeah, that's a pretty complete uh, force majeure clause. So uh, Professor, what do you think about this clause here where they specify a great many um, uh, triggering events. So they include war, they include um, sabotage, terrorism, explosions, uh, epidemics is mentioned specifically. Maybe you could speak to what the effect of mentioning that would be or maybe omitting it. But this is a very specific list. Um, is there anything that contract students or, or those who are interested might want to know about writing lists like this? Did it again. Uh, the most important thing I think, guys, is uh, the words including but not limited to. That's very good drafting. If you put this list up and, and you don't have that and then something happens that isn't on the list, guess what? You have just contracted. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're saying we're not assuming the risk of these things that are listed. But if you leave something out, uh, then you are assuming the risk of those other things not mentioned. This one's uh, very well drafted because it, it's got that uh, including but not limited to language. Um, and yeah, epidemics is there and also any other governmental order or action, you know, the orders closing businesses or gatherings of larger than 50, uh, that's listed too. So yeah, this is a very, very well drafted clause. So that gives some certainty to the, to the parties in this case, so since they actually have a, a pretty well drafted clause, it seems beyond doubt that this epidemic would trigger this clause. Would you agree? Since, since epidemics is specifically mentioned here, uh, we're definitely gonna be in a, in, a, in a force majeure event at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'd like to hear, I know Professor Jabru is here as well. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear if he agrees with us that uh, this NBA one at least, at least is better drafted than the others that we're gonna be looking at. Um, hi guys. Yeah, I was just listening in and um, I think I agree uh, looking at this, uh, the, the terms that are mentioned here. Um, I definitely agree. I think they were very thorough. Uh, the NBA legal team must have looked at a number of these um, alternative ways of doing it. I think they must have um, decided we need to include everything. So it looks very, and, and I agree with, uh, with Professor Hewn as well. That, that term is, is definitely important, right? Um, so some, some phrase that just shows um, any reader that the list of things that are mentioned here are not exclusive, right? Um, and so why, why fight um, in, in court when you can just use something that's already been litigated, right? So I think uh, it's a really decent uh, term that, that is included here. And we've seen uh, some of these in in property law as well. So when we get to that, if we get to that, if people are quest have questions about them, uh, we can talk about it. 
So if we agree that we have a force majeure event, then we need to move uh, to the triggering, the triggering of force majeure event will cause section D to be activated, which means the NBA shall have the right to terminate this uh, agreement with some notice provisions and some time. What does that mean to terminate this agreement? I mean, what would happen if the NBA terminates its, um, its agreement with its players? What, what does that mean for basketball? Well, it, they'd have to renegotiate the collective bargaining agreement if they terminate it. it, it it's a good opportunity to remind our, our attendees of the difference between rescission of a contract, cancellation of a contract, and termination. Rescission is where uh, there's an affirmative defense like excuse, and uh, both parties are going to be released from their obligations. Everybody's discharged. Cancellation of a contract happens when one party breaches. And one party is going to be liable for breach because they didn't perform. Termination, the, the, the correct specific legal definition of termination is uh, that the parties have agreed. They agreed in the contract that either both of them or one of them has the right to end the contract. And uh, th that too is, is not a breach. It just means that neither one of them has any obligation to perform anymore. But yeah, they, they would have to sit down and renegotiate the collective bargaining agreement. This one was just entered into March 5th of this year. This is a brand new collective bargaining agreement. So that would be um, really pretty astonishing if they were to throw it so, away and <laughs> start over. So um, is there, I didn't see anything in this contract that led me to conclude how that negotiation would go, whether it be favorable to players or favorable to management. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, so what, what would happen upon renegotiation? So a couple of things I would just point out is that negotiations don't have to succeed. And so people might worry, um, well, what if they fail? And I, I don't know if we have an answer to that, because if the players in the league don't come to terms, uh, we don't have basketball for the foreseeable period. But they're almost certainly going to renegotiate. Do you have any thoughts, or Professor Gabru, do you have any thoughts about who probably has the leverage in the situation? or? Do you want to be a prognosticator and uh, suggest how you think this might play out? Do you think it's likely that they'll come to terms or do you think this could be a prolonged um, retract, you know, debate where they, they don't come to terms easily? Um, so I don't, um, I watch some basketball, but that's, that's as much as I know about the sports in the U S. So, um, so I, I might not be able to tell, talk about the details, but I mean, looking at the bargaining power between, the players and the, um, the associations, I think the associations have a sort of a, a monopoly, right? So if you're a really good basketball player in the US, the, you know, the NBA is your only shot if you want, if you want to be kind of a famous player and, and make it big, right? Um, and, and I was thinking about this when I read this uh, force majeure clauses. Um, there's no way that a you know, LeBron James could say, oh, I'm, I actually don't like this list and I, I want to change it, right? So I feel like to the extent that I am aware, they can't negotiate this contracts, right? These are adhesive contracts. They either take it or leave it. I don't know if um, I'm mistaken here. So, um, you know, the, the lawyers for the associations must have looked at all of these terms and said, um, this represents our clients' uh, interests, right? Um, going back since the uh, start of the NBA, these are all the risks that we've seen, right? The uh, breaking out of war, the, uh, you know, I don't know if we had a major epidemic that um, disrupted the NBA games in the past, but this should, I think, this should definitely make the top five or so. Um, so they put that on the list, and then I guess at some point they just say, we've got almost everything covered, and of course we have that casual phrase uh, that said, you know, including this list, but not limited to that list. So, um, I think in terms of bargaining, the associations are just at a, at a very significantly advantageous position. Um, and maybe to the extent that the players could create some sort of um, a cartel or an association or just like coordination where they can say, um, you know, we won't play unless these terms are included or edited out or something like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from our audience too. And, for, and Professor, well, maybe our audience might think about some questions once you've had a chance to express your view and we can open it up for-, for our, I, ha I did have one more thing, chatting. sorry. Uh, yeah, it, and it was a point that you had raised in an email before, before the program. Um, going back to those earlier provisions, um, B and C, 
Uh, they allow for salary reduction in the event of any games that aren't played. And about 20% of the games are being canceled. So that's 20% of their salary that's going to be held back. Uh, I agree with Professor Jabru. I think, you know, not only is there a monopoly on playing pro sports, they've got the money there. And, uh, and what about paragraph? What about the paragraph that allows the clawback? You had some interesting speculation about that. Not only can they withhold salary for games that aren't played, they can make them repay it. And they can even make the next team that somebody's traded to um, make them repay it to that to that next team, and it would be sent back to the original team. Um, and you asked the question, but I'd like to see, you must have thought about it. Do you think they're going to be able to claw back money from the players? Is that, is, is that going to be possible? And I know that that's a, not a legal question because they do have the legal right under the contract. But as a practical matter, is that going to happen? I think there's a couple of reasons why it might not. I mean, first off, um, it's not clear that these players are going to have those funds. Some of them live beyond their means as it is and are probably not going to be able to make payments on their Lamborghinis uh, once, once the, um, the games stop. So uh, one is just a practical matter of collecting money from people who don't have it. I also agree with you that as a legal matter, this contract does give them uh, the rights uh, to claw back funds, which is sort of an odd provision that it's not, they're not, what this provision does is it actually allows the league to reach directly into the bank accounts of the players and take back money already paid to them. Um, that's what a clawback means. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, that needs, that means there needs to be money in that bank account to take, but also I don't think the players are going to be giving it so willingly. It could be a negotiating chip that they have. So even though there's a legal right on the other side to that money, the access to it could be a bargaining chip that gives the players a little bit more strength in any future negotiations. And um, I think that there are some courts that might be sympathetic and be uh, less willing uh, potentially to enforce this clawback. Uh, now, uh, it obviously was agreed to in here, but there are some concepts around unconscionability and sometimes that arises because of a supervening cause. So I think it's gonna be harder to get this money than the contract makes it seem and can and actually gives the NBA players a little bit of power to the extent that they have money in the bank. Uh, I think that gives them a little, a little bit of a boost. The only thing I'd like to add is that some of the owners have Lamborghinis too. <laughs> Absolutely. They may have more Lamborghinis. It's a question of who has the most Lamborghini payments to make. Um, any thoughts from the audience? About, uh, about the NBA and, and, and uh, particularly from the perspective of a sports fan, any thoughts about who has the power, the, the players or the leagues? And who has the, who has the popular support? Feel free to unmute or just chat in if you have any comments. And if not, we'll, we'll take a look at the Major League Baseball clause next. All right, let's talk baseball then. So let's take a look at what's happening with uh, Major League uh, Baseball. And um, uh, uh, actually, you know what, before we move on, we did have a comment from a student who, who mentions that um, in general, NBA players have the most power of players in any league. And, um, you know, I think that's interesting to, to mention that the NBA players uh, may have more power vis-a-vis -vis baseball players or vis-a-vis uh, hockey players or football players. And, you know, there are some very famous basketball players that probably carry a, a, a huge amount of clout. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting about the sports is that in basketball versus football, the players are more visible, both literally and figuratively, and that may give them some power and popular support. So that's a, that's an interesting dimension um, to, to add to that. Uh, and another comment was, I'm not sure if the public would support the players to receive the money while people are suffering economically. I mean, there's, you know, I think you and I talked about this, Professor Hume, that there may not be a lot of sympathy for uh, mega wealthy basketball players um, not receiving millions of dollars and having to have their Lamborghinis, um, you know, uh, um, uh, taken back. So uh, I think those are all, all, all reasons that, I don't know if the sports owners are much more sympathetic you're on mute, but I think you were agreeing that they're not so sympathetic. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 if I had to wage the public relations spell, you're right. People are suffering and, and it seems like a lot of money to pay people to play a game, but um, why should that money 
go to the owners instead. There's, you know, as between two people who, in effect, neither one of them caused the epidemic, what we're really deciding is who has the risk. And that, that's, what, that's what this topic is all about, guys. It's all about who has the risk, as Professor Ornberg was start talking about at the beginning. We're trying to assign risk here. And in drafting these agreements, we have to be careful about writing them because if we say some things and we don't include others, so we may be assuming the risk. Well, the bottom line is, as between the owners and the players, who's assuming the risk of this epidemic, that games are going to be canceled, that uh, there may not be you know, money coming in, and uh, are the players going to take that risk or are the owners? So let's talk baseball. And I'm going to put up on our screen to kick us off here our next set of uh, force majeure provisions. And what we're going to be looking at here is the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement, uh, first, and then the uh, Uniform uh, Player Contract. So there is a couple different documents here that interface. So just take a moment and familiarize yourself if you haven't already, but uh, I've, I've tried to put up on the screen the uh, relevant portions of the baseball uh, contracts. And again, Professor Hewn, I, I know you had some thoughts about this and what we're doing in part here is to look at the differences between these provisions. And one thing students might notice right away is how much shorter uh, these provisions are. Um, they, they are just far fewer words. Uh, they also are lacking some specificity and, and there's um, a few terms of art that aren't defined, but maybe you could draw our reader's attention to a couple key points in, in this contract that you think distinguish it from the NBAs. Yes, uh, th this, this is very different, you're right. And uh, not as good, <laughs> very, very poorly drafted force majeure clause. So the, uh, they get paid under the CBA, they get paid starting with the first regularly scheduled game, which I think was March 28. So we're already past that and they're already losing games. Um, the uniform player contract, paragraph 11, gives you know, the opportunity here to um, not start the games. So this contract is subject to federal state legislation, regulations, executive or other official orders or other governmental action. And that sounds very, very broad, doesn't it? And that sounds like it could include closure orders and things like that. But now look at the rest of this sentence and think about the history of baseball and it may have a very, very narrow application um, respecting, so those governmental orders respecting military, naval, air, or other governmental service. They're talking about Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. I mean, this is wartime. This is talking about baseball being suspended during a war because of you know, government regulations relating to the military service. That's how I read it. I absolutely could be wrong, but my goodness, in, in, in looking at that really carefully, if that's all it means, well, then it has no application to this situation. It doesn't help Major League Baseball at all get out of their obligations. The other I, part of I, that I, I is- I agree with that. Uh, yeah. Before we move on to the second provision, I just want to see if anyone has a thought about that. I, I want to agree with you because there, there's a concept that words need to be read in their context. And uh, if you think about, as Professor Hume did, the history of baseball, and look at how this language is so focused on specifically, not just military, but then calling out naval and air, as in Army, Navy, Air Force, you could almost read into here, um, and the other branches. If that is in fact the intention, uh, then we might limit the scope of this paragraph to include wartime, which would exclude a pandemic. Uh, if you know, I think that's a fair reading of this, and um, you know, people can chat in if they if they agree or disagree. But I I think that's right. At least it seems to indicate that way. I wonder when it was drafted. Yeah, yeah, it might be old. And there, you know what? There's another paragraph in the uh, back in the payment one. In fact, I think it's section D in Article Six under payment, uh, where they talk about how. Uh, but you you should be paid during any time that you're called up in the reserves. So there is that kind of focus on the military elsewhere in the contract too. Um, and it wouldn't be the first time that that actually, you know, came up. Uh, so we have some of those terms in here, but 
but not to dwell on them. Um, you, I, were, I just you, were spec that, you were speculating about whether it would apply to a nurse who's called nurse. into government service. What, did you reach a conclusion about that? Uh, I think that I think it's colorable, and I did find at least one story of a major league baseball player who was a professional nurse. Now, at this point, we don't have like a nursing corps of engineers or something where we have a conscripted service, so it, it's a bit speculative. But it does seem to me that other government serve. If the idea here, if the concept that this list represents is conscription to uh, service, uh, and we have the word other here broadening that beyond military, we have military and other. I think that if there were a conscription uh, to serve in a non uh, in a medical capacity, I think that that would be covered potentially by this. And in addition, um, it doesn't actually say the word conscription; it simply says service. So I think it would include voluntary service if a person, uh, you know, uh, or if if the situation had a, a context of of voluntary service. So a player who uh, has training as a nurse who voluntarily. Uh, stops playing in a sports league in order to give aid during this critical time. Um, those sort of contexts seem to fall under the other governmental service the way that I, I read this. So that makes it a bit broader, but it doesn't expressly relate to a pandemic, but rather to the, um, the call up, the call. The, the second part of this paragraph, and I think it's distinct. I, I think the second part is a separate force majeure clause. Uh, that uh, this contract is subject also to the right of the commissioner to suspend the operation of this contract during any national emergency during which ba Major League Baseball is not played. The President of the United States declared a national emergency on March 13th and baseball isn't being played. So those are the two elements there and I, I think that that is satisfied uh, in this circumstance. But I was thinking, you know, that the president was very reluctant to put that national emergency order on, really held off, didn't want to do it, was worried about how it would affect the stock market and, you know, the, the whole country. And that national emergency order could come off sometime, you know, beginning of May or something. How, how do you guys, Professor Orenberg, Professor Jabru, how do you guys read this? Is this um, a national emergency declaration or a national emergency capitalized or... Would it refer to any old national emergency like we have now with a, you know, an epidemic? The fact that it's lowercase is confusing. Um, national emergency has a, a very specific meaning and it feels casual to the point of sloppy that it's not defined. It's used in a, in a common sense and it clearly should be a defined term. So I'm sure that Professor Gibru and I can speculate on various meanings of national emergency but as a contract drafting perspective, it seems a poor choice to leave that an undefined term and up for speculation. Um, however, since it is lowercase and we do use the term any, uh, I, think it, I think you have to make a decision whether to read this paragraph 11 disjunctively and separate the concept around military conscription from the separate concept around any emergency or whether we're gonna continue to limit emergency to the concepts around war it invites it invites either meaning. I think it's ambiguous, but I think we could make a colorable argument that it's broad enough to to include this particular emergency, given that it says any and it's not defined. Um, I agree with that. So I, I was thinking as you were speaking, uh, Professor Orenberg, about the the skill as a lawyer of drafting contracts that um, that help your client avoid litigation, right? So. You can say to your client that um, I think this contract that we have um, is good enough that we can win through litigation, but it's just much better to make sure that you or anybody on the other side knows that it's a losing case if they go up against that contract, right? So um, putting it in, in plain terms saying, you know, if a national emergency is declared by the president or something like that, very clear uh, so that what your client wants is included in the contract, I think is... Uh, really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, highlight here was the difference between um, the contract that we've seen here and, and the NBA contract um, and whether that's linked to contract interpretation. Um, in a sense, what I'm thinking of is, you know, contract interpretation obviously is, is looking at the context through which the contract was drafted um, and industry standards or industry practice is one of those contexts. 
Um, but I was wondering if the courts would look at the industry as the NBA or each association, or would just would they look at all sports organizations or organized sports um, nationwide, or would they just focus on that particular association? And so um, it might be slightly a different topic than we uh, talked about, but I thought that was a really, really interesting thing to consider looking at the contractual terms here. That is an interesting point. The, the whole problem with drafting a force majeure clause is we're giving up the common law doctrine of excuse. If we don't have a force majeure clause, we can still rely on the common law doctrine of excuse, you know, perhaps to save our client because if something's impossible or commercially impracticable or the purpose of the contract has been frustrated, we can still argue, oh, that affirmative defense is available and we can get our client out of the contract and excuse their lack of performance. Once we include a force majeure clause, and if we've got a bad one, uh, I think we're pretty much stuck with that. I, I think you, you, you could argue that, oh, this wasn't the whole intent of the parties. We just had a force majeure clause that mentioned a national emergency, but they didn't really mean to limit it to that. The problem is, as you said, I mean, this is, we're talking about interpreting the intent of the parties once you put it in the contract. And surely the lawyers had access to other contracts, you know, they could have seen what the NBA did and, um, or what people do in other contracts. And I don't think a court is going to be very sympathetic to a baseball club that has tied itself to a quote national emergency and, you know, or, or, or worse yet to declaration of war. Um, yeah, I think the parties here have drafted a poor agreement. Um, and if we're going to just compare the two, in fact, the existence of the NBA agreement and the, the fact that these are major leagues, literally, um, that have these publicly available and that the NBA has such a better and more clean, clear, accurate uh, depiction than baseball, it, it almost makes me want to put some fault on the baseball contractors for, for not doing a better job uh, clearing that up. I mean, at a minimum, uh, national emergency merits a definition, but but in addition, smushing the concepts of war with any national emergency, I think, opens the door for an ambiguous interpretation as to whether or not those are meant to be read in context or whether the disjunctive makes them two separate concepts. I mean, I would, I would have put those in two separate paragraphs and defined, uh, defined national emergency at, at a minimum. Without that, I don't think we have clear answers, which means we're going to have litigation on the point, uh, most likely, if, if people are contesting it. Any thoughts from, from our uh, audience about uh, the MLB contract? And I can put that back on the screen and then open up the chat and then we can move down to our, our football clause. But before I do, put this back up here for our audience and see if anyone wants to share any additional thoughts. All right, so I think that's what we have for baseball. Um, they could have done a better job for sure, and it harkens back to a uh, bygone era of uh, forced conscription, uh, conscription into military service. All right, let's talk about the NFL and see if football has done a better job. So once again, uh, let's just start by taking a look. And the, the structure of the NFL's agreements was interesting to me. The NFL has uh, what they call a constitution and in addition to this constitution, uh, which appears to be an NFL document, I didn't, I, please correct me if anyone knows uh, that I'm in error, but I don't believe that the players necessarily agreed to this constitution. Uh, the league seemed to de de decide it for itself. We have a separate uh, players agreement as well. And so let me open this up and get this onto the screen. And then um, once again, Professor Hewn, if you can kind of take the lead on indicating for our viewers, um, what do you find interesting about this? Well, not this agreement, but these set of agreements and, and how, do they, how do they interface? Yeah, there's, there's no force majeure clause in the collective bargaining agreement. The collective bargaining agreement here, section five, says that uh, players are gonna be played starting on the first game of the regular season. And they're going to be paid weekly or bi-weekly starting with the starting with the season. 
And then the NFL Constitution says that, you know, the regular season starts with the first regular game. And then they have a very incomplete clause here in section 19.2 of the NFL Constitution. There shall be no postponement of regular season games unless said game cannot be played because of an act of God or because of state, federal, or local prohibition. Prohibition, not recommendation. So if, if state, federal, or local prohibits the playing of a game, the game can be postponed. Doesn't say anything about cancellation. It's silent as to cancellation. So that's going to be something that we'll have to struggle with a little bit. Um, a couple and then, and then, and then the, the last part down here, this, um, what's the relationship, and you raised this, Professor Weinberg, what's the relationship between the collective bargaining agreement and the Constitution? Well, there's a contract clause. You know, we, we have a merger clause here, and it says that the agreement supersedes the Constitution um, if it's conflicting. Is it conflicting? So we really have a, a I mean, it, it's a great question. Does section 19.2 of the Constitution conflict with section five or does it supplement it? You know, I, I would think it would supplement it because it is a force majeure. But on the other hand, it, the collective bargaining agreement says these people are going to be paid starting with the first game. And the Constitution is basically telling us when they're not going to be paid. So in that sense, it does sort of conflict. Uh, just um, of the three, I, I don't know how you guys would, would rate this, professors, but uh, I would put this one a dead last in terms of how poorly drafted it is compared to, uh, compared to football, certainly, and even baseball. I think it's worse than that. I'll make a comment about the structure first, because I, I find this just very interesting from a, a totally academic standpoint, but maybe students will find it interesting too, is what we have here is something that looks like an integration clause. Um, and in fact, it is effectively an integration or a merger clause, but instead of relating to, um, you know, parole evidence in, in the traditional sense of oral pre preliminary negotiations and, and oral statements made prior to, to execution, this could theoretically supersede a, a player's contract uh, or other and the constitution, even if that was entered into subsequently. Um, so that's sort of an interesting way to draft it. Plus it raises the broader issue of what is a conflict. And just like the parole evidence rule is sometimes hard to apply because we need to distinguish between um, what will basically we have to establish the scope of an agreement or a term and something only conflicts with things that are within its scope. Uh, so then we have to do a, a rather difficult analysis of what is the scope of 19.2 and, and more to the point, what is the scope of section five? Does this section five include within its scope concepts regarding postponement and deferment of pay? If so, then that would appear to be a conflict. I tend to agree with Professor Hume's analysis that this appears to supplement and not to complement section five, but I think it's, it has opened the door to an argument that there is in fact a conflict um, because here we are silent as to uh, what would happen in, in the event of an act of God. So the structure that they've chosen to have with these constitution and bylaws on the one hand and the players agreement on the other uh, and one superseding each other to the extent that they conflict has added a lot of confusion. Um, and it just, it's, it's a good lesson to remember that simplicity is often the most effective way to accomplish your client's interests because complexity can often get you. This is mired in complexity and there's far too many different agreements that are, have a lot of interplay. And um, I would also say that as a result, while the agreement itself on its paper is not the worst, I think the MLB has the worst drafting, but structurally the NFL has the worst overall um, uh, rules and regulations. So they're, they're just simply, there's the most conflict here. I don't know, Professor Gebru, do you have some thoughts about the structure? Um, yes, so, uh, that's one of the things that I was focusing on was, I mean, looking at um, documents that govern relationships between two parties. So the more documents you're introducing, the more compl complexity you're introducing, right? So if it was just one document, we would not be talking about, you know, one document superseding another. 
uh, but when you have two documents, and maybe there is a justification for why they have two different documents, but uh, the fact that the relationship is governed um, with more than one document means that you're getting into issues of uh, interpretation and whether, you know, is this within the four corners of the document? And are you introducing um, other materials that are not, um, you know, inherent to the document, the contract in quotations that the party signed? Um, I would imagine both of the documents would be the contract, but again, you're running into that problem of two different um, um, legal documents, um, one potentially saying something contrary to the other. So in this case, it might not necessarily be um, directly contrary to the other, right? So section five might not be um, specifically and clearly saying something opposite to what section 19.2 is saying. Um, but if one is silent and the other is saying something, generally you could say the document that's saying something should uh, should govern the situation, but um, that's again, that's going to lead to litigation because it's not clear. And so I would agree uh, with the conversations we've been having about um, the, the simplest, the most clear um, communication of the information is the, the better, right? So the, the rights and obligations might be complex, but the wordings should be simple, I think. Um, so it's kind of going back to this general uh, thinking in, in, I guess, general writing, but also in sciences where uh, the best uh, writers are the uh, people that communicate complex words with very simple um, wording. So I feel like that applies to lawyers as well, uh, if not more than other professionals. There's a couple of terms in here which are, by the way, not defined. So, I mean, I did mention I thought the drafting was a little better than MLB. I might take that back. Act of God, I did a little search for here, is not defined within the Constitution. And it's not mentioned in the Players Agreement. Um, Professor Hewn, the fact that that term is not defined, um, do you feel confident about what that term means? Are you certain that it covers a pandemic? And did the drafters open themselves up to any problems by failing to define this term? Yeah, I, I agree with you. That that can be ambiguous. I was, I was thinking that a court is more than likely going to say that an epidemic is a uh, an act of God. Um, I wasn't as worried about that. I, I, I think that the present situation is what people loosely mean by that. I, you know, theologically, I hate to blame God for these things. I don't think that's a very good idea, very sound in terms of, uh, you know, what we believe that we want to be like, you know, the ways in which we try to make ourselves, you know, to to be good people. I, I don't think we want to be following the example of a God that imposes, you know, tidal waves and epidemics on people. I just don't like that theologically. But anyway, yeah, as, as, a, as a legal term, I think an act of God is going to include an epidemic. You know what I was worried about? I was worried about that word postponement. And I'd really love to hear your opinions on that, my fellow professors. Because, because we're really worried about cancellation. Does it? It, are, are these are, are, it, these games aren't being postponed? They're being canceled. Does the force majeure clause apply to that, or am I just being overly literal? Am I am I taking too you know narrow a semantic approach to say that uh, this is this isn't going to apply to canceled games? Well, maybe you could claim it's an indefinite postponement, um, or that uh, you know. The, if, but you're right. I mean, then you were kind of stretching and torturing the meaning of the term. We could, I think a court would most likely imply the intent of the parties was postponement or cancellation, but it is again curious uh, that, I mean, good note, God knows how many lawyers the NFL has. Um, why are they drafting things in this way? Why would we give them the benefit of the doubt uh, where, where they are one of the most wealthy organizations one could think of, and they probably have teams of lawyers pouring over these, these, this verbiage. Uh, but I agree with you. I think it's absolutely problematic that once again, there's no uh, concept of cancellation. I think, I think a court would reasonably include cancellation to be constituted here. I think for similar reasons that you would be willing to construe act of God to include a pandemic. Uh, just that's just the reasonable, I think, interpretation. But once again, you know, sloppy drafting has opened the door for litigation. Well, Professor Geber, do you have some additional thoughts? Do you, are you troubled by the lack of the concept of cancellation here, that this, this agreement never mentions that? Yes, so I am um, concerned about that. And I, 
again, through litigation, you can convince the court that this is an indefinite postponement of the games. But, uh, and again, that, that's, that's going to take uh, resources, time and money from your client to prove that. So why not just say um, cancellation and postponement if that's what your client wants, right? Um, so it's, it is, it's not a good drafting. I think the lawyers really uh, did not do their job. Um, and again, uh, what Professor Armberg is saying here is important in the understanding of the document, right? If the NFL has, you know, resources and they have um, you know, hundreds of lawyers, I don't know how many they have, but um, this is not a, a contract that was drafted by someone who, you know, uh, uh, in the middle class or someone that does something else and, and has to hire a lawyer to draft this contract or basically kind of a, a, a lay person drafting a contract that they think is is valid. These are professional organizations with professional lawyers uh, whose full-time job is to do this, right? Um, and so if they chose that word, I think the court is going to interpret that contract against uh, the NFL, especially because, again, uh, because this is a, a contract that the NFL is having the, the players sign, it is going to be interpreted against them. And so uh, leaving any, any word for litigation, I think, is going to be um, to the disadvantage of the NFL here. There's another wiggle word here. I think Professor Hume was indicating that. Before we even get there, by the way, Professor Hume, previously you mentioned that this is a bit out of order, too, and, and just feels a little sloppy. I mean, why would, we, why would we go from state, which is the middle level, to federal, the highest level, to local, the lowest level? It would be more sensible to say federal, state, or local, or local, state, or federal. But that's just a curiosity. That leads us to the word prohibition. Prohibition is different than recommendation. Um, is social distancing currently a prohibition? Uh, is social distancing a, uh, are we prohibited from being within six feet or is this a recommendation? Um, are we prohibited from congregating or is it recommended we don't have groups of more than 50? And does that also affect whether this clause is triggered? It, it goes <clears throat> back to that major point the whole point of a force majeure clause is to identify the risks that we are not assuming. These are the situations where if we cannot perform, it is not a breach. And you would think that they would be very, very, very careful to, um, you know, as broadly as possible, identify those situations where they are not going to be liable if they're unable to uh, perform. Because as soon as we decide that we're going to use a force majeure clause, uh, we are now saying, well, here are the things that we, here are the risks we have not assumed. And by implication, everything else is a risk that we are willing to assume. And so maybe we have to play these players if we don't have a uh, government prohibition on the games. I agree that we can screw against the draft. I think Professor Gabru mentioned that. And so the league has really left itself vulnerable in this case. Um, you know, I'm quickly changing my opinion to rank this as the worst of the three agreements as we've talked about it, because look at how the league is vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they've canceled, they haven't postponed. And so the force majeure clause isn't triggered at all. They're, they're vulnerable because they have prophylactically canceled games where a prohibition is not necessarily going to extend, you know, into the season. Um, it just it just uh, it just feels like this force majeure provision isn't going to do the work it was intended to do because it wasn't drafted properly, and most likely um, that is going to give leverage to the players. Let's come back to that negotiation point. Uh, we can kind of and I'm gonna I think I think we've got the language here, but you know let's talk about that negotiation point. What what is going to happen next? I and mean, the NFL season um, is still a, a sparkle in our eye. It hasn't come to be yet. Um, the future is uncertain. How is uncertainty going to play into this and what do you think is going to happen? Well, the, the, uh, I think your point is valid. It does affect the negotiations. Ultimately, I, this isn't going to be settled in court. Hopefully it'll be worked out by the parties. But the, um, to the extent that someone has already established that they have not breached, to the extent they can say, we have a force majeure clause and we did not assume this risk and we don't owe you this money, uh, that, that certainly is gonna give them leverage and that'll affect uh, the, ultimate, um, the ultimate compromise that they come to. It's gonna affect their bargaining power. 
Any, uh, any other thoughts, Professor Gabru, about uh, where the NFL stands in relationship to this and what, any, anything you expect for the future as we move toward uh, the season? Um, I, I, I agree with what uh, Professor Hoon said. I think it's just, um, it's going to be a private negotiation and we'll see if uh, the parties, how the parties react to this epidemic and um, how it affects the parties' rights. But it is definitely going to uh, be impacted. That negotiation is going to be impacted uh, by how the public looks at what the, uh, the each institu institution is doing, right? So if the NFL is seen, seen as maybe because of the, the poor drafting that we've seen, uh, going to court, fighting with people, um, it's, it's just not going to look um, well on, or good on, on their part. But the thing is, going back to the first point that I made, you know, they do have a monopoly. And so even if you don't like it, that's the only game in town. And so you're basically going to have to go with, the, with what the NFL tells you or what the NBA tells you. Um, and so they do have that bargaining power. Um, the, I think the main leverage that players have is um, to the extent that they're um, bargaining agreement, um, their union allows them to to push some terms, maybe they can do something to, to change the force majeure clause. Now that we've seen something uh, that looks like it's pushing against the provision, maybe they, they would negotiate something in there to say you know, we should be paid or we should only be paid or we should only not be paid if, if X, Y, and Z things happen. So um, maybe the contract might actually be better after this um, pandemic is done with. Professor Capri, do you think, is there any chance that a court might say that the NFL constitution just doesn't even apply, that, that they, they were unable to get it into the collective bargaining agreement and section two of the collective bargaining agreement says that, you know, conflicting portions of the constitution are superseded. Uh, is there any chance that we don't even have a force majeure clause here? Or do you think that, um, the reasonable reading of uh, Article Two, Section One of the Collective Bargaining Agreement is that, yeah, we'll, we'll include the force majeure clause of the NFL Constitution. Yeah, I think that's going to be. I think it depends on the the strategy that the plaintiff in that case will um, adopt, right? So, what what action are they bringing? Uh, what documents are they citing or basing their action on, right? So, there is some. Uh, I think strategizing that needs to happen on the plaintiff side to convince the court that the constitution should not apply. But it, my sense is that the court might might say that the constitution um, is relevant at least. And again, this depends on what type of court we're thinking of or what, what type of court hears the case. But uh, if it's a court that is friendly to uh, extrinsic evidence being introduced, um, right? Maybe this is not extrinsic evidence, but if they're open to that, they might just say the constitution uh, should be relevant here. Uh, but again, they're bringing in a document that's not very well uh, written. So it is, even if it comes in, it's going to be uh, not that much help as opposed to if the NBA type of uh, provision was out there. Yeah. All right, so just to, to close things off, uh, since we have about five minutes left, um, you know, one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is all the other people who are involved with the NFL, NBA, MLB. I mean, there are a number of people who may not have uh, lawyers, for that matter, and may not have carefully drafted agreements, may have signed contracts of adhesion. I'm thinking about people like the people who serve concessions in the stadiums or who um, you know, the janitorial staff who are, uh, may not be employed or, or may be working under challenging conditions. Um, you know. Um, maybe this is sort of a lead in to another conversation topic, but do you agree that nothing we've discussed really relates to all those thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans who have uh, agreements with the NFL or the other sports leagues? Sure, the, the sponsors. There, there's already news stories about sponsors wanting to back out, um, that uh, uh, ad companies that buy, you know, advertising, big blocks of advertising, uh, they want to black out because the leagues are not playing um, mm -hmm. broadcasters, obviously, uh, all up and down the line. Yeah. And, and, and of course, it's the doctrine of excuse, as well as the possible existence of force majeure clauses in some of those contracts. 
but yeah, you're absolutely right. This triggers a domino effect uh, all up and down the line. Yeah, so it's important maybe as we're kind of rounding off the conversation to remember that force majeure is a way of contracting out of the default. And the default is uh, the excuse doctrine, namely in most jurisdictions, impracticability, in some jurisdictions, a higher standard of, of impossibility, and on the other hand, frustration of purpose. So if the purpose of paying the NFL a million dollars a minute was so that your advertisement will be seen by 400 million people, well, that uh, is going to be frustrated uh, if in fact no one is watching the games or the games don't occur. Uh, and in fact, it may be impossible to put those advertisements on if the games don't occur. And uh, the purpose of these provisions was hopefully to avoid that difficult situation of basically a court ruling in equity, whether it would be fair or not to impose the, the risk of the pandemic upon the league or the advertisers or the person who sells the concessions or the janitor. Um, I'm not sure these agreements were perfect, but at least they attempted to get us out of the default. Uh, Professor Gibru, did you have some closing thoughts? Yeah, I was interested in the uh, the previous comment that you made about you know the the terms that we've seen only represent a few um, parties in that uh, relationship between the associations and the players. I mean, you can see it in terms of like different uh, degrees of um, I guess resources, but also relationship with the associations, right? So the players are in a good place. You know, some of them might be. Uh, living beyond their means, but you know, a lot of them are not starving, right? They're, they're fine, they might have homes and, and the like. But when you see it, when you stretch it out to all of the parties that are affected, because we're not having um, you know, games played in the stadiums, you, you'd find you know, the person that was selling jerseys outside of the stadium, um, who doesn't even have a contractual relationship with the association, right? Is now out of a job, right? Um, and so you can see that spectrum and see you know, all of the people included uh, in that relationship. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a quick connection with property law here, where the biggest thing in property law is um, moratoriums on evictions, right? So we're saying because of people being laid off, they can't pay the rent. And therefore, you know, states are saying don't require rent from their your tenants. Uh, but the problem then is in that relationship, you're looking at, you know, the big landlord that, you know, can take on this risk. Uh, but we're ignoring that there are you know, families who live off of renting properties. And so if you say, you know, you can't ask rent from, from your tenants, you might be saying you can't have any income for, you know, three months or so. Um, and so there are other repercussions out there. Um, some states, are, I think, are looking at it more broadly and saying, okay, if it's that kind of landlord, maybe the banks also should not ask money from those, those families. And so kind of um, stretching out the ripple effects. Uh, but bringing it back to sports, I think it, it's, I think about allocating risk, but um, even when you allocate risk, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entity that you think has the resources um, is the one that would take on that risk, right? Right. And it is allocating risk. There's no winners here. There's only losers. And it's a question of who is going to lose the most. And that's the unfortunate circumstance that brings about force majeure and brings about excuse there needs to be something terrible that's happened uh, in the world. And, um, and then the question is, how do we allocate the cost of that um, unfortunate event? Uh, but I don't think there's going to be, at least in this context, a lot of winners. It's just a question of how do we, how do we protect people um, in, this, in this really tumultuous time? And, and just I, I hope that people who are watching this are aware just how many people are going to be impacted by this beyond the, the players and the, and the owners. Uh, Professor Hewn, you had some thoughts to, to close. Yeah, we, we all have that in our lives too, don't we? Uh, how are we going to take care of everybody? And what a challenge. Professor Ehrenberg, I have a question for your distinguished uh, uh, panel here. And that is speaking from a spectator perspective. Obviously, we may not have the same volume of spectators for any of these uh, major league sports when uh, uh, the pandemic is over. What do you think will be uh, the result of new contracts for the players uh, when the seasons reopen? And what other provisions may need to be placed in there um, to 
cover all involved? I think that the first effect we'll see is that renegotiations result in overall lower salaries. There's just a smaller pie to share. And um, it's just a question of, uh, so that we're gonna see smaller salaries all around. I think it'll, there'll be some volatility, maybe some of the, um, the biggest players that may be seen as responsible for bringing people back to sports and back to the league will actually do a bit better. But overall, I think we're gonna see the average salary of players in all three leagues decrease uh, after negotiations. And I think that we're gonna see some modification to the agreements themselves that it's, it's sort of like um, how we do with regulation. We have, a, we have a catastrophe and then we look backwards and we regulate to prevent the past from happening again. Uh, likely we're gonna see these agreements modified to be more clear around what would happen for a pandemic and hopefully to spell that out in the future. So I think those would be the two major changes. What do, you, what do the rest of the panel think? I think that for most of the teams, broadcasting brings in more money than gate receipts, about 70-30. And so the effect on the clubs will be significant, but not devastating. However, in situations where the clubs do not own the stadiums, where there's a separate sports authority or something that owns the stadium, uh, those contracts are really going to be affected because revenues at the stadiums will probably be cut in half when you think about ticket sales and concessions and all of that. So those are absolutely going to have to be renegotiated. Our, our uh, uh, guest has, uh, I think, accurately foreseen that. Um, I would agree. I think the, uh, the result would be a reduction in the salary of the players, right? And again, this is linking back to the, the fact that the, the other party um, going against the parties is, is um, some an entity that has a monopoly and so a, a better negotiation uh, spot um, when it comes to the, the risks that we're looking at. Um, something that I, I thought about when Professor Hume was talking about um, you know, where the money comes from, uh, broadcasting is, is really interesting and this is, um, I'm drawing from my intellectual property uh, interest here. Um, it was in the news that, um, you know, now that games are not uh, being broadcasted, I think the companies were thinking of rebroadcasting random games from the past. And I was just thinking of who makes money off of that, right? So the players don't have a copyright over that recording. And so the, the companies that um, benefit uh, would be the, 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 the uh, companies that are broadcasting this and, and maybe the associations uh, that gave the licenses to uh, the broadcasting company. And so, you know, those associations that are behind um, the broadcasting of the, uh, the, the games that are rebroadcasted now, uh, they continue to make money, maybe not um, comparable to where if it was a live game, but they're still making money. But the players have already given up their copyright, I, I presume. I haven't looked at the intellectual property terms. And so it's, it's going to, I think that there is that effect as well of, um, you know, as a player, your means of income is limited, but as a company, I think you can, um, you know, there's merchandising going on, there's uh, rebroadcasting and other things that the companies could benefit from, um, even if not uh, to the same level that they're used to. Were there any other audience questions before we wrap it up? Feel free to unmute and jump in and ask another great question. Well, with that, I'll thank everyone for attending our webinar today. I hope that you came away with some um, high level thoughts about how sports are gonna be impacted by coronavirus and, and now have a few more tools in your toolkit for understanding the contracts. And some of these contracts uh, may affect some of you. I know one of our uh, attendees has a husband who works for an NHL team and those contracts are going to be uh, you know, at, at, at issue here. And there's gonna be a lot of ramifications for this. So we hope that we have a chance to present to you again as things develop. And once again, thank you for, for tuning in and spending the hour with us. So have a great rest of your day. And Professor Hune, Professor Gebru, thank you very much. It was great to hear from you both. Thanks for organizing it, it's great. Thanks for putting it together, Seth. A pleasure. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>